Welcome, everyone. I've got you muted. But that's so, I, let's turn, we can talk first, but uh, let's unmute everybody for a second. Welcome, everyone. I'll uh, get started as uh, people are just sort of popping in still. And uh, well, we might as well get started. They'll come in. Okay. Um, close off this window. Welcome everybody and uh, uh, I hope I'll make this an interesting presentation for you. Uh, we're going to talk tonight a little bit about the Jewish roots of, uh, of Anglo-American law. Uh, First, let me tell you a bit about me, uh, so uh, uh, you know uh, what I might know about. Um, the, uh, let me put up a screen with that. I've been practicing law in uh, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia for almost 36 years, a little uh, uh, over 35 years. And for about 25 of that time, uh, I've been studying Talmud. And I was always a history buff. Um, and it struck me as I was studying Talmud that there were a great number of similarities between Talmudic law uh, in dealing with certain uh, civil law areas and American law. And some of the curiosities that I was taught while studying American property law in particular made a lot more sense when I thought of them as, uh, as uh, uh, issues of, of Talmudic law and looked at their sources. Um, the, uh, let me get an idea of some of my, my, the group I've got here so I know uh, how to speak about this. Uh, you see on your screens uh, something that says reactions. It's usually on the bottom, but sometimes on the side. Could uh, any lawyers in the crowd, could you like raise your hand and say you're, if, if you're a lawyer? Uh, any, uh, any, any uh, historians, whether by hobby or whether by uh, uh, profession? Um, and uh, cool, cool. Um, and uh, professors? Okay. Uh, and uh, religious leaders? Um, well, come on. I know most of you from either FJMC or from, uh, or from Men's Club, and you're all religious leaders. Uh, but uh, uh, let's get some concept of what we're talking about in the room in the influence on law. Um, law students have been taught for at least the last 200 years that our law comes predominantly from Roman influences, uh, that the models are Roman and the, uh, uh, and, and the, the basic patterns are Roman. Uh, this is not supportable. Uh, if somebody has studied Roman law uh, and studied Jewish law as well. Uh, I kept seeing curiosities uh, and similarities in my Talmudic studies that did not make sense uh, in, in, uh, in, in Roman law, that had no parallel in Roman law. Uh, but the problem is that when you see the same pattern in both one area of law and another area of law, you have to figure, you have to guess whether one caused the other. Uh, and that's a topic that historians are generally afraid of. In my prior training as a political scientist, we were told you could prove correlation, but proving causation was another matter entirely. However, lawyers have to address causation all the time. It's something that's routinely proved as part of many a case. Uh, and we have a rubric by which that is done. Uh, and I'm going to apply that rubric to try to prove causation here. Uh, that rubric is basically proving opportunity, motive, and pattern. We're gonna look for similarities between Jewish law and, uh, and English law for the opportunity, for the motive, and the pattern. Um, let's look at some of the opportunity first by looking at some of the history. Um, While many of us think of England as, until modernity, having very few Jews, 
this was not true for a lengthy, significant period of time that ended a long time ago. We all know about the destruction of the temple in the beginning of the Roman diaspora in 70 CE. And many of us know, studying Abba Eben's book and many other books on Jewish migration and the Jewish encyclopedia, that the migration occurred both to Northern Europe, uh, it occurred to Israel and to the Levant, and it occurred in large part to the Iberian Peninsula, uh, to places like Granada uh, and uh, Andalusia uh, on the Iberian Peninsula. Well, a curious thing happens in 1066. Two curious things happen. Turns out they're within a week of each other. First of all, the Norman conquest is concluded. William the Conqueror seizes, London, uh, seizes England and claims it as his own. And it becomes his own from then until now, although it's been through different uh, 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 successions. Um, at that time, in 1066, the Normans come in and change the system of law entirely and create something called the Domesday Book, in which basic patterns of real estate, of property holdings, are defined for the entire country. Curiously, six days later, in Granada, is one of the first of many Muslim persecutions of Spanish Jews on the Iberian Peninsula, leading to a mass exodus of the established Jewish community there, uh, which included poet and philosopher Moses ben Ezra, Judah Halevi, and Maimonides. Now, while the three of them did not go to London, they went to other places. What we do know is that a population moved into London at the, invest, uh, at the uh, invitation of William the Conqueror and grew to 4,000 families in London by the time of the expulsion. Uh, during that time, however, we also know that they had very little right to, to hold property. Uh, they were brought into the country for the purpose of bolstering the economy after the conquest and after the disempowering of the, uh, of the then native population, the Welsh uh, and the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, and however, it wasn't until 1177 that Henry the first, the second grants Jews the right to own any land at all. And it's then that we, we know this because Henry the second in 1177 grants Jews for the first time the right to own some land. And that land is the right to own a grave site outside the city limits. Because prior to 1177, if you lost a relative outside of London, you needed to bring the body to London so it could be buried at Cripplegate. Um, otherwise, there was no other place. But we know that in till 1177, there was no right to hold property. During the period that then follows, Jews remain in England for 224 years. This is no short period of time. It's as long as approximately the amount of time we've had since the US Constitution. Uh, we go through William the Conqueror, William Roos, the second Rufus, Henry the first Beauclerk, who is called Bloatclerk in large part because he's uh, becomes famous in English history for creating massive numbers of the writs that form the basis of, of Anglo-American law. Uh, then Stephen of Blois, then Henry II, Richard Lionhearted, who we're going to talk about a great deal, um, and then very famously King John, uh, known for Robin Hood, whether or not that story is apocryphal, uh, followed by Henry III. Uh, and Henry III is also known for a great number of the modern writs that turn into our civil actions today. And finally, in that succession is Henry I Longshanks, who uh, invites the Jews uh, to leave in 1290. Um, the, uh, curiously, now I wanna show that that's no short period of time, so I've put up just a set of pictures, sort of the official press pictures of, of the kings during this period. From, Henry, from William I, William the Conqueror, to Edward I, Edward Longshanks. Uh, it's, as I say, no short period of time. So we have opportunity. We're looking for opportunity from pre the period of 1066 to 1190. Uh, what's happening at that same period of time in, in European history? Well, something pretty significant. Something called the Crusades. It changes Europe fairly completely. Whether it changes the ownership and the title uh, and the, uh, to the land of Israel is far less important than what it does to all of Europe. And it's particularly important to what it does to England. 
for what do the Crusades require? The re Crusades require money, uh, massive international expenditure, and massive international travel, massive international trade. Here's a picture out of one uh, text about the number of, uh, of uh, the amount of travel that was being done across Europe in the medieval era. All of this needed to be funded, and all of this needed to be funded with money. And in that century, uh, during that, that period of time, money was land. There were no banks. Some say the Templars ran a bank. Some people say well, what the Jews were doing was banking. There were no banks as we think of them today. There were no stocks. That's a mercantile invention. Uh, there were no uh, currency was not defined as it is today. Uh, all those things come out of the mercantile era, which isn't going to happen for hundreds of years. Money was land. So we have a need, and we find in many of the texts that are published uh, 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 reviewing that starting with Richard I, starting with Richard the Lionhearted, concessions were granted to the Jewish population of England, the Jewish population in London, to grant loans uh, to and to be secured in those loans. Um, and it's that pattern we're going to look at. But first we're going to look at things that aren't, uh, that, that are not the same. It was suggested in 1951, uh, just in the aura after the Holocaust, that maybe much of American law had come from Jewish law. Uh, one of the things, it was suggested that transfer of property had come from Jewish law because we transfer property by contract. But let's first figure out what we're going to talk about when we talk about pattern. Certainly, we have to watch out about citing the Torah. The Torah is claimed under three different names in, by three different cultures, um, and all the cultures, uh, all of the major religions that are covered by the Crusades. Uh, to suggest that if a law cites Torah, that means it's Jewish law, is going to be difficult to sustain. Uh, we also know that in the beginning of America, the Torah is cited frequently. We know in the capital laws of New England uh, in 1641 and 1642, there's 13 different citations to Torah. Uh, we know to this day, we still have uh, uh, more uh, citing the Ten Commandments as being one of the basic sources of law. And even if we read the Ten Commandments, a little differently than our Christian colleagues do. It's still the same basis of law. Rather than using the Torah as our basis, I'm going to look to something else that's particularly Jewish, that is certainly not part of the Catholic canon, and that is Talmud. Uh, so let's look back at one of the issues, the first of the issues, the one that I think is the easiest of them to prove, although I think there's many others. Um, let me ask first, again, if you can, if you can raise hands uh, uh, to, to, to let me know. Who's, who here has either been through a closing or read a deed of trust, read a mortgage or deed of trust, if it's Maryland, you've read a deed of trust, um, and, uh, uh, or, uh, or been through a closing or seen what a closing documents look like? Okay, okay, a bunch of you, uh, indeed most. Um, who of you have ever either been in a pawn shop or, or uh, pawned something or bought something from a pawn shop or watched pawn stars? Okay, a bunch of you for that as well. Um, the, um, uh, think to yourself, why isn't a mortgage? Why is it not like a pawn? When you go to pawn something, you take the item, you give possession of it, to the person you're securing with, and they give you money. And if you come back with enough money in the right period of time, you get your object back. And if you don't, it's theirs. Uh, that's pawning, but that's not at all how uh, security in land works. Uh, indeed, you've all probably heard the joke back when you, uh, uh, wait a minute, we've got a new person entering. Back, back when you bought your first house and were feeling terribly house poor. Uh, you probably, uh, uh, Daryl, if you could either mute, oh, actually, I thought I had you muted. Okay, that takes care of that background noise. Um, the, uh, 
uh, and I'll open that up later when we get to questions, uh, but uh, I just want you all to be able to hear and not inter be interrupted. Um, the, uh, uh, we've all heard the joke when we first bought our first houses and we're feeling terribly house poor, the, the joke about who owns the house while the bank owns the house. But the bank doesn't possess the house. It's not at all like a pawn shop. And when you're secured in the house, when the bank is secured in the house, he's, they, they can't take the house. They can't even take it after you don't pay. There's a whole procedure for them to take it after you don't pay, and they can't take it. Um, the, they have no specific right to the house. They have a specific right to something else that has a name. Uh, well, similarly, the, the, the concept of owning property in Anglo-American law has a name, and that name is called season. Uh, S-E-I-Z-E-N, but sometimes spelled S-E-I-S-E-N. And when you hold the property, you are seized of the property. The concept is very difficult for law professors to describe to their, uh, to their uh, first year students. Uh, but the easiest concept I've heard it described as the Scarlet O'Hara in Gone with the Wind, where if you remember that famous movie, she grasps the soil and she says, it's the land, it's the land. And it's a very physical act, it's a ceremonial act. And we see that sort of ceremonial transfer in other areas of law. Specifically in Roman law, there's something called mancipatio. And just in case, I didn't ask if you all pronounce Latin, but if any of you know that I butchered that word, that's because I can't speak Latin. Uh, but I believe it's mancipatio. Uh, the, the ceremony is called the Maginaria Venditio. Uh, and in that, five Roman citizens go upon the land. One of them, the master of ceremonies, is carrying a copper uh, hammer and, uh, and a copper set of scales. And he bangs the, copper in, the two pieces of copper into each other. And then the new owner of the land or slave, it doesn't, it's not distinguished based on what the type of property is, declares a series of words and then is thereafter the owner of the property. In season, on the land, one grabs the land or some other symbol of the land and passes it to the new owner. Again, a physical act of ceremony. It was argued that Jewish law allows the transfer of things through something called star. And star or stara um, are found, are, are Jewish contracts. And they're found throughout and will often be things that I refer, that I refer to as connections between Jewish law and American law. Uh, but star doesn't apply to land. Land in Jewish law must be transferred by locking or fencing or breaching, or in the case of Hefker, of, of ownerless land, it must be transferred by benefiting the land in some way. It doesn't appear to be, instead, Jewish law transfers property by something called chazakah, um, which is also a ceremony. Think about whether we have a contract or a ceremony, because I would suggest that there's no reason, if, we're, if it's a contract, why do we sign a contract for purchase of land? And then sometime later, seven days, maybe a month, sometimes longer, sometimes a little bit shorter, uh, we go to something called a closing. Now, surely some people will think the reason we do that is so that you can investigate the land and determine whether you want it. But what other things do you investigate after you contract? In advanced, uh, uh, in advanced trade, there's sometimes letters of intent. But I'll bet nobody on the screen has done a letter of intent. Uh, or maybe, maybe once or twice in a lifetime. Um, the uh, uh, closing is quite different. Indeed, I would suggest the ceremony of yore has been replaced in modern times, at least in residential closings, by an equally memorable event in which hundreds of pages of unread and indecipherable documents arrive not long before uh, a well-dressed matter of ceremonies comes in and leads the lady through uh, a series of signatures, copying, and handshaking, which is universally accomplished in under an hour. That ceremony is conducted in private, unlike livery of season, unlike imaginary of Indicio or Kenyon, but it's followed by a public recording. I think it's only through our modern prison that we imagine this to be a contract rather than a ceremony. Uh, Professor Auerbach she asserts that it's Jewish kesef that's the basic for modern sales of land, but that seems just a bit ambitious. Um, 
there are other examples, and I'll try to be brief of them so we uh, get to the stuff that does work. Uh, in, in American law, when you want to prove you have title uh, to something, you may make something called a claim for quiet to quiet title. And basically, it's a phony lawsuit. Uh, it's a phony lawsuit in which you sue somebody who you know doesn't own the land, and then it's uh, a procedure is set for how you prove that you are the claimant to the land. Uh, and wait a minute. okay, somebody else asked to come in. I'm sorry. Um, the uh, um, you just again. Okay. Um, Roman law has something called injure cessia, which also is a phony pleading uh, designed to, to quiet title. On the other hand, in Jewish law, of Bob and Maxia, page 2A, Ben Nanas argues that it's better to pay twice rather than to take a false oath of any kind. Uh, just doesn't seem to match. Second, egalitarian virtues. We know in American and English law, the, all the way back to Domesday Book and Fealty, what was most important in American law, uh, in English law at least, was uh, knowing title, was certainty of title. But in Jewish law, it goes all the way back to the Jubilee, uh, which regardless of the fact that scholars say the Jubilee never actually happened. But even if it never happened, the concept of Jubilee is that at the Jubilee, title returns to, to uh, uh, the family that owned it to begin with. Um, and uh, further, Star, talking about very briefly, uh, is universally it is universal because you don't have to even be literate to enter a contract. Uh, the signers aren't even the parties. The signers are town professionals uh, or professional witnesses uh, who sign the contract for you. Um, and uh, that allows anybody to enter a contract. Anyway, oh, and finally, the one I like the best because it's only changed in the last year, uh, a year or two in Maryland central to, to title in all of English and Anglo-American law has always been certainty of title at all times. And only in the last couple of years has Maryland for the first time, we're talking a year or two ago, allowed something that was taught when I was in law school as a springing uh, uh, interest in land. You can now in Maryland grant a power of attorney to somebody else while you are competent, such that the power of attorney doesn't begin until you're not competent. So when you wouldn't have been capable of giving the power of attorney, that in old English law would have been unimaginable to William the Conqueror, would have been unimaginable during any of the period we're talking about here. Um, in any event, oh, and, and Jewish law at the same time has at Bava Batra at 54B and 55A, uh, fictionally disemboweling title to a cow. Uh, and no Jew is allowed to claim that he owns the cow. The cow's unowned during Shabbos, uh, but then becomes re-owned on, on Saturday night, uh, and no Jews allowed to claim that he owns the cow. Um, the uh, that type of of fiction was is perfectly acceptable in Jewish law, but the kind of fiction of a false pleading is not. Doesn't match Roman law at all. Doesn't match English law at all. However, how we secure that land very much matters, and very much seems to match. And why it matches is even more interesting, at least to me. We know from other sources that before, uh, bef before, uh, uh, I'm sorry, let me get the right slide back up. Um, we know that before uh, Edward I, um, we know that for, from before Edward I, when we think well before Edward I, debt was secured by land but could only be collected from the chattels. So if you lent somebody money and they didn't pay you back, you could take his cow off his land. Or for a year and a day, you could take the next harvest uh, from his land. Um, that's called usufructus, and it exists in both Jewish and Roman law. But it's not very useful because it doesn't give you very much. And the amount of money that was about to be lent during the Crusades was huge at least for its time. Jewish law, however, has an interesting corollary because in Jewish law, back in the Talmud, in Gittin at 47b, we see an argument between uh, Reish Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan, 
uh, two of the great sages early on in the, uh, uh, in the, in the Talmudic period. Uh, the, um, and they're arguing about whether the possessor of the land brings the first fruits in a use of fructus, or whether the title owner of the land brings the first fruit. Now, th th this is to bring the first fruit for sacrifice. But to give us some context, this debate is occurring over 200 years after the last sacrifice had ever occurred. Uh, I would posit that we aren't really, the Rish Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan are not arguing about when the temple's rebuilt, what will we bring? Of course, it might be applicable there too. What they're arguing about is whether the possessor or the title owner is the one with the predominant right. And where does that show up later? Well, um, as, uh, as the, um, I'm sorry, I lost myself in the outline just a bit. As the crusades required more money, the necessity becomes the mother of invention. Uh, and all those crusades have to be funded. And simultaneously that's happening as a different type of title is being invented. What we know for certain is the type that the, the land could not be secured by the property all the way up through all the Crusades. For as the Crusades are ending, even in, in 1270 or 1254, uh, we know that it was not until 1275, and I'm quoting actually here from something called the Selects, Pleas, Stars, and other records of the role of the roles of the Exchequer of the Jews. Uh, this was first translated in 1902. It was not until 1275, 15 years after the Edwardian expo expulsion, 15 years before the Edwardian expulsion, that a Jew was legally capable of holding so much as a 10-year agricultural lease. And the license then granted was subject to the express reservation that he received no homage or fealty from Christians. Um, what the Jew could not own was the land. What he could not take was the property. Um, the, at the same time, we know all the way back to Richard I that in the records of the uh, of the roles of the Exchequer of the Jews, we see that the Jews collected their debts under the protection of Richard the Lionhearted, uh, allowed to enforce their lien in the name of the king. And later, as time develops, usufructus develops. First of all, to give it a context, in 1250, or around 1250, feudal services that had been the very basis for, for uh, medieval land ownership and feudalism, where the vassal got the use of property in return for showing up with his horse, his armor, and his troops uh, when, the, when the king needed him. Uh, that gets replaced by 1250 by something called scuttage. Uh, scuttage is basically a version of rent, uh, although not rent as we think of it today. But what happens as that same period of time is occurring, as we're going from duty uh, and fealty to money, well, we see usufructus developing at the same time. Uh, Professor H Hazeltine cites multiple sources in his book in, in 1909 that mortgage first appears with the arrival of the Jews in England. Um, it first, the mortgage in any means shows up as the Jews come into England. But even then, it was just usufructus. A title passes to the lender while the debtor remains in possession. Uh, and there was the big invention, which we also just saw in the debate with Reich Lakish and Reich, Rabbi Yochanan. Um, on default, initially the creditor only takes the fruits and then only to use the land, like a life estate, but not to rent it out. Well, that's not good enough if you're lending enough money. The concept of season, I've described before only too briefly, but the, the concept of season that's tied to the land, that's grasping the land, becomes something new. Season begins to apply to chattels. And, and as the professors described back then, that's an impossibility. You can't have grasping the land with, with a diamond in the fireplace, uh, with a jewel in the fireplace. Yet something gets invented called Sezina Utdevadio, um, or called season as a gaiji, and gaiji from the word Mortgage. Uh, the uh, Maitland 
refers to that, even though he doesn't acknowledge a Jewish role in any of this. Mainly refers to that as season of the Jew. Uh, the uh, what's being invented. Maiden suggests that because the documents hadn't been translated or he hadn't read them yet, uh, that it's unclear whether a Jew could take the land if he was not repaid within a year and a day. But we know, at least from now, from our perspective now, we certainly have to translate in the roles of the exchequer of the Jew, under no circumstances could the Jewish person take the land. Um, Maitland suggests that may be what's happening instead. Instead, what we're winding up with is a very unromantic, and I don't mean that in terms of love, unromantic in terms of Rome, um, is a new unromantic type of title in which possession is superior to title, a concept utterly unknown to Rome. And that, my friends, is called a mortgage. Um, this is just one example of the influence of, uh, of Talmudic law on modern American law. Um, I, I was asked by Alan to make sure to keep this short, and, you know, uh, because it's just to entertain as we come into the evening. But other examples include lost, found, and mislaid, abandoned, and treasure trove property. Uh, both in my first studies of real estate, uh, of, of property in American law, and later on, much later on, in my study of Talmud, both my property professor and Rabbi Kahan both started us on lost and found property. And as the property law professor explained to me later near graduation, that's because the definition of how we control lost and found property defines property and society itself. And that is entirely Jewish, uh, as we can review at some other time. Uh, also, Pro Professor Brody of, uh, at Emory University has published in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Emory's Law Journal about bailment. And the next thing you study in law school uh, after lost and found property is bailment. Uh, bailment also was fairly early in my Talmudic study. Um, and uh, uh, again, because bailment defines how we relate to each other over property. Um, and that's also in its, there's no source for it in Roman law. It's entirely pre-mercantile, pre-industrial Roman world. Uh, but from storage lockers to short-term leases of less than 10 years to banking and fiduciary duties, it's all not coming from Roman law. And there is a model for it in Jewish law, uh, in Talmudic law. And it all shows up in English proceedings in the affected period. Another area is security interest. Now that's a very short lecture because really we've just done the basics already here. And that is that security interest um, in Jewish law differentiates little, little in between security interest in land or metaltoli and chattel. But, and Roman laws of dominium is useless to have no possessory interest. Anyway, I want to thank you all for attending. I want to take whatever question. I know the concepts here are complicated and, and probably require some absorption along the way, but I'm happy to take whatever questions there are. I'm also putting up a slide with my contact information, because you're more than welcome to contact me. Email's probably better than calling me. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and ask further questions then. If, if, if you thought about it and the issue strikes you as interesting uh, and you decide you want to uh, uh, you ask a further question about it. I'm, I'm available to that. It may not be what I do as practice of law, but it is absolutely a, a topic of interest to me. Um, also, I welcome you, if you found this topic interesting, uh, to please let Alan Budman or me know. Uh, as I said, there's at least three other areas I could talk about. However, if you've covered it enough for you, that's okay too. Um, Okay, if anybody has any questions, uh, raise your, uh, actually, I think what I'll do is I'll unmute you all because we don't have that many people. As long as I can figure out how to do that. Give me a second to figure out where the unmute all button is. Uh, oh yeah, there it is. There. Oh, we have more people try to get in. I'm sorry, they missed the whole thing. A whole bunch of people just came Richard, in. Richard, we can unmute each ourselves simply okay. by depressing the space bar. Thank you, Keith. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it, though, for everybody, and we can, and anybody wants to remute themselves. Karen, so she never got back to you after saying she got back to her and was going to get back to you. Is that what happened? 
whoever that is, if you could hit the mute button. And um, I feel that the soul of our nation is at stake right now. And we need to do it. And we also need, and that was, I think, what you all were talking about. We need moral leadership. We also need. That's it. Okay. Uh, anybody, anybody have any questions? I do. Keith, go ahead. Uh, you're saying that Anglo law developed with the influence of uh, uh, Talmudic. How did the French and the Germans, perhaps uh, the Italians, how did their uh, idea of mortgage develop and how does it differ? Do you know the, uh, do, you, do you know their mortgage per, uh, per so, procedures in other countries? In the same period of time, we can't really talk about French as French. Remember, the Normans are French. They're also Vikings. Um, and, uh, and they considered themselves somewhat different. All of, remember, modern, also modern French law has nothing to do with any of this because it's all Napoleonic. That was all changed some years after our revolution, uh, having nothing to do with medieval times. But to the best we know of French law, it was predominantly canon and, 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 uh, and Roman. And Roman, we know fairly clearly, uh, Roman, the causes of action were dominium, where the only thing you could prove, you had no way to collect back. If somebody took something from you and you were the owner, you could get it back. But if you held something um, and you were not the owner um, and somebody took it from you, you had no cause of action. You, do, you weren't the owner. You couldn't sue, say, it's mine, give it back to me. That was the cause of action called uh, 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 dominium. I have the domain over this. There are several other causes of action, but none of them are based on possession. The only prior system, I, I'm, I'm uh, Vandergraaff, I think it was. It's in the article that I published it at, uh, uh, at Cambridge, uh, and I'm, I'm simply slipping his name. But uh, an argument is made uh, by uh, one professor that perhaps the concept of possession comes from Greek law, but it looks nothing like it. And the citation that he gives to a more ancient source that it comes from the Greek law says nothing of the kind at that citation. That requires a little digging to get back there. Um, what we know is that there's, that the concept of possession as being superior to another possession is exists in some sense in Greek, but not at all in a usable sense, uh, and is completely foreign in French, completely foreign in, uh, uh, in Roman. Um, there are many other legal systems throughout the world, uh, and I'm certainly not familiar with all of them, but those are the likely ones that were influencing, that, that were available to influence. Yet the word mortgage, I believe, comes from Old French, and somehow I'm sure it comes from uh, Latin. So that no, would suggest French. there is an origin. It's in all French. Mort gage, which is dead pledge. It translates from Old French to, to dead pledge. Uh, and that um, pre presents other levels of interest. The word is not Jewish. And for that matter, it should not surprise any of you that, that nobody adopting Jewish law into English law in, in, in the 12th century is going to say they're adopting Jewish law. I, that's going to be at least in politique. Uh, the term mortgage comes from someplace else. It's, it's a French word. It's an old French word. Uh, but the concept isn't French. And indeed, the French don't call it that and never did. Anybody else? Did I answer your question? Uh oh, Keith, Keith, I think you froze. No, you didn't. Um, anybody else? I mean, I understand it's sort of an esoteric topic, I, you're, uh, uh, and and I, I welcome you to to you know hang on to it and and if if you find the topic interesting, to say so. Um, hold on. Let's go back to the contact stuff. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I see a hand up. Hold on, unmute. I've got, I'm trying to unmute you. 
There we, oh, there, okay. It finally, it's just being slow to respond. Yes, did you have a question, John? No, just, uh, this is all very fascinating that, that uh, our laws come from a Jewish source, but there is a, a Roman source to begin with that the split happened. That's, that, that's, that's a fascinating point. Also, how the kings got involved in all this is, where's, uh, was the king the, the source of law at the time? as a person who's, you know, holding court? Yeah, actually the term court comes from exactly that. And to what extent at which times will vary. But I, that's a little beyond our scope, but it's a topic of great interest to me. Uh, when you're, until Henry III, uh, starting with Henry I, let me go back to that chart and, and put us back in. Um, yeah, the, the, the point I'm making is we were at the mercy and uh, uh, reason of a monarch to make this happen. Yeah, 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 but that goes two ways. And people don't recognize that that goes two ways. Uh, the, uh, uh, certainly, the Jewish people have been shipped out of more countries than many other than the Roma. Um, the, uh, uh, but uh, uh, whether they had money in their pockets is not something that, that could, much could be done about. If, if you want, to, until the Holocaust, I don't think there were too many examples of not letting anybody leave. Um, and uh, I, I think there were one or two slaughters. You know, there's more than a couple of slaughters. But the concept that you're going to get to the business community and say, give me your money. Um, now, in many times in history, the Templars, and I think 1290 with the Jews, at the end of the Crusades, when Edward the first doesn't want to pay his bills, um, the, uh, the it's it's entirely plausible. It has certainly happened to the Templars. It seems to have happened to the Jews um, that when they don't want to pay their bills at the end, they say get lost. But trying to get the money out of their purse to begin with is a lot harder task. And in the time of Richard the first, he creates the Exchequer of the Jews. There is an Exchequer. He creates the exchequer of the Jews expressly for the purpose of reassuring the Jewish population, even though they can't collect the land. And even though the only valuable thing in that society is the land, the armor costs a fortune, especially in their money. But they think half in time and half in money. Uh, it's, it's a different world. It's not a mercantile world. The mercantile world isn't going to happen for, for several hundred years. Uh, the, the value is in the land. And if they're going to pry the cash to buy food, horses, carriages, and armor, um, they're going to need that money to come from someplace. And that's a two-way street. And was there, yes, people, was, go ahead. Was there a uh, kind of a, uh, uh, a religious Christian law that one Christian cannot lend money to the other, and that's open an opportunity for non-Christians to lend money? And also, kind of back-to-back, -back, is that why uh, kings and other monarchs saw uh, Jews as as a uh, uh, well people who are smart with business and that that you can kind of go around that no lending to each other that the that the church forbade. Yeah, I, I actually, I think that's fairly well documented. I mean, I, I I'm not sure that the Jews were any smarter at business than anybody else, but at the time in question. Uh, business wasn't a very important thing to do. Land was a very important thing to do. Um, and, uh, and power was an important thing to do. And fealty was an important thing to do. Uh, but uh, uh, money, that was important if you were going to go on a crusade. And you were going to need to pass by towns and buy food. Because they weren't going to take your fealty. And they weren't going to give you a peppercorn or hold their land in their hand and give it to you. <laughs> you know, they, now you needed money if you're going to travel, if you're going to be engaging in international trade. And they weren't killing everybody they passed. Uh, mostly they reserved that for the Jews. <laughs> but the, uh, uh, but uh, I, there was plenty of killing going on as they passed by. And when you run an army past another country, you can bet bad things happen. Um, yeah. But uh, mostly they need to buy their food or they're not going to find their food. Um, and yes, it is implicit in what I'm saying about that at the beginning of the Norman, at the end of the Norman conquest, when William the Conqueror 
moves into England and, and takes it. He has wiped out a whole bunch of wealth uh, by dispossessing the Danes and the Anglo-Saxons and the Welsh. Uh, and he wants to bring people with no fealty rights to come in with money. So he invites the Jews and the, uh, and the Italians. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and some writers say he invites Europeans. Um, and plainly he's doing that to get money. And particularly he's interested in the fact that no move is made to let those Jews hold land. As, as I said, not until 11, uh, uh, not, not until, uh, what's the date on that, 1177. Uh, so, so you mentioned earlier this sort of easement to allow uh, for cemeteries. Uh, that's a royal decree or just kind of a practical, a practical situation? Well, they weren't too concerned. To, to, what we have is what we have. What we have is the edict that allows Jews to purchase uh, uh, land outside their, the walls of their town. Now, if you've gone touring around in Europe, you see that in many of the churches, it was the custom to bury your very, very the closer you got to the altar where you were buried, the more important you were. Uh, and the, the cemeteries are right in the middle of town in the, in, in the yard. We still do that. Many of our religions do that in the United States. You can see that at, at, at many, many churches here. And you have to go to England to find them buried under the floorboards. Um, but, but there's plenty of burying under the floorboards in England. Um, and, uh, uh, but Jewish law requires that you be buried outside the town limits. Um, and we do know that the decree that was issued allowed Jews to purchase a plot of land for burial outside the town limits where the Christians weren't burying their dead. Um, and so you get to, you know, I, we don't know exactly if that's six feet by three feet or, or, or what exactly that means. What we do know is if you could own tracts of land, why would the king himself issue a decree that you could buy a plot of, of, of a cemetery plot? But uh, uh, the question was, uh, Jews were not allowed to own land. So the cemeteries may be uh, an exception. Yes, yes, yes. And in the English way of thinking of law, a 10 year lease, uh, for, first of all, there's fee simple, which fee is probably short for fealty. Um, there's fee simple, then there were all sorts of others, there's fee tales that no longer exist, but have only ceased to exist for far shorter than, than people think. It, they've not, never been in America. Uh, there's fees, they're at the top. And then down below then come these lower estates and land. And I'm saying it with a face because that's how my property professor taught it. This little stuff, like a 10 year lease, what's that? Anything less than a 10 year lease was, was barely an interest in land. Um, and uh, remember in a society in which land is valued and particularly when land is purchased with fealty, uh, not with money. Um, the, uh, uh, that land becomes significant and how hold, long you hold the land becomes significant. Um, the, uh, and Jews were not permitted until 15 years before the expulsion. Now I've got, I cannot prove this next proposition, but I'll only say it in response to a question. Why would it be 15 years before? Why is that right after the Crusades ends? Well, I got a way of explaining that. Here we've had six crusades, uh, and, and we're deeply in debt if we're the nobility. Uh, and we need to come, and, and it's a negotiated process. If you've ever had a workout with a lender, you know, that's a negotiation. Uh, so there's a negotiation going on the workout, and they probably negotiate to get something better, like a 10-year agricultural lease, which they don't get until 15 years before the expulsion. Well, now it's practically vassalage. Now you've crossed the line. Now, now you're at 10 year leases. Wow. Uh, nevertheless, at, by that time, there was no fealty. Now there's just scud. There's still fealty. There's no fealty by service. There's fealty by scudage, um, which basically becomes rent. Um, but uh, uh, there is still plenty of land in England that is a peppercorn for a hundred year lease. 
and they don't call that ownership. The title's still in the queen. Um, but uh, one, one of the ways that the, the king would would uh, honor or uh, pay the people who fought for him would be uh, to provide a, uh, some kind of land to the generals and soldiers af after a war. What land would that be, and you know where that land come from, and and it, and uh, would that be the royal land or is just land they conquered and just decided to give it to somebody who fought for them? If they fight and they succeed and they conquer, then all the way back to Roman, there's plenty of money around and there's plenty of land around. Um, and they give that land away. Roman soldiers often wind up with land in the far out reaches. Um, the, uh, but Rome, remember, we're past the Holy Roman Empire now. I mean, Rome has collapsed. It's been 600 years since the collapse of Rome. Um, and, uh, and we've been through what Europe calls the Dark Ages, though it's hardly dark for either is, uh, Islam or Jews. Um, but the whole concept of commerce has sort of fallen apart unless you're an Arab. Uh, and uh, uh, European commerce is, is, isn't the same. We've gone to feudalism. And feudalism, the reason is, is a structured pyramid uh, in which you get land for pledging loyalty to the vassal. You're a vassal of the Lord above you. And at the top of that pyramid is God. And one below that is the king. Uh, so if you're not worshiping the right God and giving the right oath to that king, you, you can't be in this line. Uh, it's not that they were trying to discriminate against Jews. It's you're not qualified. And by the way, that has other similarities to foreclosure. Because back then, the whole idea of foreclosure is that you need to put the property, when you, you foreclose doesn't mean you take the land. The, it's become that, but that's not what the word means. You are foreclosing something, which a foreclosing is the right of redemption. Um, the, uh, the right to take the land by paying the money off in time. That starts with the year, paying off in a year and a day, and later turns into something bigger than that. It turns into a right that you can redeem up until the foreclosure of the right of redemption. Uh, and, uh, uh, when they, uh, in, in it, that, that passing of the property can't occur by you taking the property. That's my whole point here. That you can take, what the Jew could do is take the land. Initially, they could take it for a year and day and take its profits. Initially, it was just a fructus. You could take the next crop. Uh, live in the land if you wanted to. Uh, Take, take possession of the land because you hadn't been paid, but you couldn't take title. Um, the, that then advances to that you can take the, 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 after a year and a day, in some contexts, you can wind up taking the land away if you're not paid off in time. Maitland suggests the Jews must have been able to do that, but he's perplexed by that suggestion because he knows full well that you couldn't take the land. Uh, so instead, what he does is put it up for sale. He can't take the land, but that doesn't mean he can't put it on the market for somebody else to buy the land. Does that sound like a foreclosure sale to you? Because that's exactly what it is. If you've ever attended a foreclosure sale, they're either on the courthouse steps, even to this day, they're either on the courthouse steps or they're out on the property. And, and a, a, call, a caller, the, the creditor has computed how much he's owed. Now, these days, he's allowed to buy it for that amount. He will bid that amount. So if nobody pays him off, he'll take the land. But the Jew couldn't take the land. Uh, so instead, he puts it up for sale. And he only lends enough on the property that, he's, that his, loan to, uh, to, to, to his loan value is high enough. Um, that he'll certainly get comp compensated. And as that's not enough, he winds up having the right to take the property for 10 years. That's the progression that I see happening. And once it's already advanced by 1275, that he can take the, the that he can actually own a 10 year lease on the land, uh, then King Edward I tells him to get lost. <laughs> Go collect your land elsewhere. Uh, but yes, what's being brought in is that they're, they're being brought in 
to contribute economically, but it's not a one-way deal. Indeed, one thing that shocked me, uh, early, early uh, uh, um, interest rates were as high as uh, this. I, I read a note of for 47.8% interest. That's for, I don't know whether that's APR. 47.8% <laughs> interest. That's a loan shark. It's usury. Yeah, well, but the juice could do the usury was any interest. Oh. If the different if the biblical definition of usury is interest, and that's what it is, and indeed to this day in the Orthodox community, Jew can't lend to a Jew for, for, for interest. They can make an investment. And it and, and uh, uh, but Jews were lending to Christians because that law does not apply across religions. Um, and uh, uh, and if it's if usury is zero is anything above zero percent, then what's the difference between forty seven point eight percent and one percent? Both of them are usury. Uh, anybody else with a question? Well, I've surely enjoyed this. I know a few of you have, oh, I've still got somebody trying to come in now. Maybe I shouldn't have used the waiting room. Uh, the, uh, I, they, they tell me, uh, not they, I, 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 we're all getting used to using Zoom for lots of things. <laughs> and I, most of the meetings I occur, that occur these days are on Zoom. And I've, I've read security things that say you're supposed to use waiting rooms and passwords. And a password couldn't apply to what we were doing. Uh, but, uh, um, anyway, I've enjoyed going over this with you. I've given you contact information. If anybody needs it again, I can put that slide back up. Oops. And now a new person coming in now. Come on, this is late and this is really late. Um, for anybody, well, let, let me connect, let him connect his audio. Welcome, Mark, and who else is coming in? Anybody who's come in and missed part of this, you should be aware that it's all been recorded. I'm going to give it to the FJMC. We'll post it on their website. Uh, and I hope it is as interesting in playback as it is the first time. Uh, the, uh, or else it's easier to turn off and not insult anybody. <laughs> and anyway, if, you're, if any of you are interested in the other topics I talked about, in other examples, uh, the problem is when I take the easiest example of foreclosure, people might think, Oh, Jewish in foreclosure, or might think, you know, it's oh, well, the Jews know about debt, and I'm like, yeah, it's a topic that's a little fearsome. The fact is, it's a lot broader than that. As I said about lost and found property, mislaid property, abandoned property, and trove, all look an awful lot like Yehush uh, in uh, uh, in Talmudic law, and bailment was the second thing I studied in in Talmudic law, and the second thing I studied in in law school property law. Um, so please let Alan know if you're interested in the topic or let me know and, and I'll be happy to do a second one of these things. And if you missed any of this because you're just coming in now or just came in recently, go to the FJMC site. Uh, it's, it'll be posted up there probably in a day or two and uh, enjoy it. And if you have any follow-up questions, I've shown during the thing a slide with my contact information. This is a topic of interest to me. It may not have anything to do with my practice, but it is a topic of great interest to me, and I will answer your emails. Um, with that, I'm going to thank you all for coming. Uh, switch to my one, one of my favorite pictures from Africa, um, and uh, uh, and then wish you all a good evening and tell you to stay safe. I know we're all locked in. That's why I'm doing cute presentations like this <laughs> after the work day. <laughs> Enjoy. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, I missed it. I was on the wrong time zone. <laughs> well, it's, it's recorded. Listen to it. If you have questions, uh, uh, come on back in. Uh, you know, e email me. That my contact information is uh, uh, is up there. For that matter, if you want to write it down, it's right there. Uh, and uh, but listen to the tape first, because redoing the whole lecture is probably. <laughs> Not the best thing to start with. Right. right. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you. Have a good Thank evening, you. all of you. Stay safe. Have a good night.